The Hornets dropped their game against the Pistons after winning on opening night. What went wrong in game number two? We talk about all that today. Plus, stay tuned for Terrence Oglesby, Hornets live analyst, going to be joining us for the last two segments all today on Locked on Hornets. You are Locked on Hornets, your daily Charlotte Hornets podcast. Part of the Locked on Podcast Network, your team every day. In a minute, cuz we live. We live. <laughs> It's Locked On Hornets, part of the Locked On Podcast Network. It's your team every day. Thanks for making us your first listen. We are free and available anywhere you get your podcast, and that includes YouTube. This episode is brought to you by Prize Picks, the easiest and most exciting way to play daily fantasy sports. Go to prizepicks.com slash locked on NBA and use code all lowercase locked on NBA for a first deposit match up to $100. That's Doug Branson. If you're watching us on YouTube, you can find him on his sub. Uh, stack every hornets box score.com. He's also on subtext where you can text Doug and get his thoughts not only on the Hawks win, but the Pistons loss. You get good and bad with one Doug Branson. And then you can uh, also listen to me, Walker Mail, every weekday on WFNZ from 12 to 3 p.m. So there you have it in the tag board. If you look at the lineup, what's to come, Doug wrote down Piston overpowered. That's exactly how you would describe this loss, man. Uh, it, looking at the Charlotte Hornets losing this game to Detroit, they lose one eleven and ninety nine, and the Pistons after the first quarter, you know, they get up to a double digit lead, and then in the second half, Hornets just not able to come back nearly as much. Some bad shooting nights all around, but you mentioned the overpowering thing here, Doug. The rebounds were a problem. Detroit had fifty three overall. Charlotte only had forty one. And even specifically, uh, Mark Williams, after what was such a strong game, three rebounds for Mark in this one, only one field goal on four attempts, you know, rebounding, not strong all around, but it especially is a problem when your center only grabs a few. Uh, yeah, and this is not a story that's too dissimilar from the Hornets and Pistons matchup of last season. Now, the Hornets are healthier uh, than they were last season, but they were healthy for a few of those matchups against Detroit, and Detroit comes in. And they hit you. They're a physical team. They have a guy on their team that's nickname is Beef Stew. And you can't be <laughs> yeah. named, you can't be nicknamed <laughs> Beef Stew and not bring the beef. Isaiah Stewart brought the beef. Jalen Duran brought the beef. And they use it. And these are two teams, Detroit and Charlotte, that are, I think, you could at best say they're unproven offensively. You could probably honestly say that both of these teams are bad offensive teams. And you have a choice when you're a bad offensive team if you'd like to win basketball games. You can either be super physical and win certain battles uh, that allow you to stay in games, or you don't. And the Hornets at this point have chosen not to. They've chosen not to be very physical, and they're going to lose games like this against teams that that hit first. I know there were there were some foul issues. There were some refereeing issues that people were frustrated by, including LaMelo Ball, who probably cost himself a little bit mo of money after the game with his comments about the referees. I understand that there are those issues, but that's not why they lost this game. Fundamentally, they lost this game because they were out-muscled. They were out-hustled by Detroit, and, and Detroit deserved to win that basketball game. Your centers cannot combine uh, for less than 10 rebounds while Jalen Duran get 17 it just can't happen well and yeah if we want to have the mark williams combo for a moment before we go to terrence oglesby I, I thought he was sensational loved everything we got in the first game and i know you pointed out some of the problems with his lack of physicality against clint capella he there were a couple times there was one moment in that game where clint cleared him out and then dunked it and so there were those times in that game to me i thought they were you know Certainly compared to last year, fewer and far between. There, there were times where Mark did welcome the contact. There are times where he meets driving guards at you know the halfway point and goes straight up, plays fundamental sound, arm straight up defense, block shots. And then here he gets in foul trouble and the, the, the physicality is completely gone from Mark. You're right. Like he got punked by Beef Stew and, and even Jalen Duran. And <clears throat> if you'll remember, Doug, Remember we wanted the Jalen Duran Mark Williams matchup last year, but Jalen Duran was hurt, and so we ended up getting the Mark Williams James Wiseman matchup. So this was really the first time since Mark Williams has become a part of the rotation that we got to see the two centers at the center of draft discourse two years ago go at it. And Jalen Duran, by leaps and bounds, won that matchup 
so that's what's frustrating here. It doesn't mean that it's going to be this indictment on Mark Williams' future or anything like that. Hell, I was just singing his praises after game one. I still love, love what we have in Mark Williams. But there are st- still clearly some things, some deficiencies in his game. And if there is a physical center who's going to have center of gravity on him too, I, you just can't get low enough on somebody that thick, that strong, that athletic, and shorter. Jalen Duran is shorter than Mark, and so – it helps. Certainly height is going to help in the NBA newsflash, but also, man, when you're trying to post up and those guys have that low center of gravity and then they're getting low and then they're being physical. It, if you go out and you play pickup basketball and then there's this like six, two linebacker and you're a six, six guy, man, it's a lot harder to move that six, two linebacker. It's a lot harder to move the strong guys that can get below your hip and push you out of the way. Cause you got no power source. And that's what happened with Mark Williams. It's hard, but you have to try. And there were a couple oh, yeah. of possessions. I'll point, and, and not just on the defensive boards. Those are obviously critical. But also, the Hornets have to dominate the boards overall. It's not just about securing the defensive rebounds that they need to secure. It's also about the fact that this offense, because it's not shooting well, and I don't think that overall it's going to shoot well this season, they've got to generate points on the offensive boards. And there was a moment, 8.22. I'll, I'll point you to it if you want to go back and watch it. 8.22 left in the second quarter. There was a moment there where... Uh, Mark doesn't, he doesn't even bother to kind of dice it up with Duran. And it wasn't foul trouble. He only had one foul at the time. So that wasn't preventing him from going out and seeking contact. He just decided not to seek the contact. He decided not to dust it up with Duran. And that, that has to change. But you're right. It's not an indictment on Mark Williams' future. It's not an indictment on the Hornets' season's future, this this one particular game. It's game two of an 82-game season. What it should be is a wake-up call that this team will not win games unless they are physical, unless they, they put that extra effort into getting those 50-50 balls. They lost too many of them last night just falling asleep. And look, th- I mean, th- there will be... There will be better days ahead for the Hornets. There will be worse days ahead for the Hornets. But mm-hmm. it, it has to be a team effort. It's not just about Mark. This rebounding issue is not just about Mark. Brandon Miller, uh, who's been a good rebounder for this team through two games and in the preseason as well, missed a couple of critical blockout opportunities that led to offensive rebounds. The, the Pistons had 11 offensive rebounds that became 16 points. That's the game. That is the ball game right there. They they secure you know, four or five of those. This this game is is totally different. It takes a completely different trajectory, uh, but it's but it's guards too. I mean, it's everyone. You know, Steve Clifford brought up an interesting point that now in today's game, offensive rebounders don't try to go and secure the basketball. They try to tap it out. This goes back to like Tyson Chandler, like six or seven years ago. Five thirty eight did this big write up on how Tyson Chandler was doing it different from everybody else because he wasn't going in there trying to grab an offensive rebound. He was just trying to get out there and use his height and tap it back. And uh, where where it's most likely going to be rebounded, offensive rebounded by a guard. Okay, so that's the way the game's played. Meaning all five guys have to be focused on securing a defensive rebound because you never know where the ball's going to go. So it has to be Mark Williams, the centers, being physical, moving the guy, and they work to secure that defensive rebound. Mark had the ball slapped out of his hands two or three times by Duran. You got to secure that basketball. But everybody mm-hmm. else has to be paying attention. You can't have two guys leaking out, you know, getting ready to run the break when there's a defensive rebound still to be secured. Yeah, and that's coaching philosophy. There, It used to be the decision, and I, I don't know if Steve Clifford has directly said what he likes most, but there are some coaches that do want you to get back and at least have one guy back to limit transition opportunities, or do you just have all five players get ready for a possible rebound on the tap out or just the normal securing it off the backboard or the rim? And so if... <laughs> Yeah, transition points and rebounds. Hopefully, the Hornets can find a way to you know find that right balance for both. And, and last thing before we move on, because I wanted to go ahead. You had another thing on that. Well, I'm just you know I think that this team is showing signs of toughness, signs of life. I mean, I like Brandon Miller dusting it up a little bit with with Isaiah Stewart. Oh, I yeah. like you know him going back Love and forth, stuff. standing his ground, not being moved. Love that. But that has to be coupled with execution. Because if you're tough and you don't execute, you're Dylan Brooks, <laughs> you know, and you're getting clowned. And as a team, you're getting clowned. So it has to; those two things have to meet. And the Hornets' season will hinge on that. Can toughness and attitude meet execution? If it does, then the Hornets, this Hornets team, if they stay healthy, have an opportunity to be a playoff team or at least a play-in team. If it doesn't, 
you know, because of the three point shooting issues that 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 I think they will have all season long, they're going to struggle mightily. One of the things too, on one of the themes, something we worried about coming into the season that was true against Detroit. It's the Hornets are going to struggle certainly at the beginning portion off of the bench. And you were six players deep offensively. And once it got past Brandon Miller, you had absolutely nothing working. So JT Thor, Teo Maladon, they combined for eight points, two field goals a pop. Teo at least got to the free throw line. But Brandon Miller off the bench, six of 13, a couple of three-pointers off the four that he took, 17 points for him uh, uh, with two assists, one steal, one block. Also got in a little bit of foul trouble at the end, just had four on the game. But overall, good game from Brandon Miller. It 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 does tell you, yeah, it, Miles Bridges, we think, is going to come back after 10 games. That's going to help. But it this one really showcased the lack of depth offensively for this team and what they'll probably have all year long. It's not one guy. I mean, Miles Bridges, um, it's not one guy. It's It's got to be a full team effort to figure this thing out. And I'll just say one oh, final yeah. thing, which is that – Forget the pig trophy. Forget this barbecue weird thing, pig south <laughs> thing that the the some New York ad executive cooked up. Forget yeah. that as the rivalry. The, this is the rivalry. Hornets and Pistons right now. I don't think they like each other. This should be the rivalry. Might I suggest a tank trophy? You know, we'll put a little tank on top of a trophy. Doug, you know, who's Doug, gonna who's I'm gonna get out of the bottom first? I'm glad I, I I love it. I'm glad you brought it uh, brought it up because I, I talked with Terry on Friday before the game. I got to go out there to the Spectrum Center. And I asked him, I had to ask him about the pig trophy. Like, do you care at all about this? And he was laughing. He's like, yeah, you know, I'm not going to say it means anything, but you know, whatever. <laughs> and, and it, it, it was funny. I asked him though. It's like, look, I guess we try to make the Hawks, the Hornets rival. You had the play in moment. The NFL teams are rivals. And do you feel like you have a rival in the NBA right now? And he didn't say yes. He said, I don't really think so. If you guys, and then he was joking, if you want to get this Hawks rivalry off the ground, that's fine. You, you can run with that. I, I'd welcome that. But I think this is it. I would love to ask him that question again. I, I think I was 12 hours too early with the question. If I right. ask him afterwards, he might say, yeah, we got one cooking a little bit. Because Terry was in that mix as well with the beefs too, back and forth. Yeah, they don't like each other. Now, playoffs make mm -hmm. a rivalry. So a real rivalry, that'll be right. when the Hornets actually make the playoffs and you play you play a team four or five times in a row. Then you'll get to not liking each other. I mean, you could have some play-in moment here between – I mean, it, it's possible. It's possible. So we'll see. All right, that'll do it for the recap. Stay tuned for the next two segments. It's going to be a lot of fun. Coming up next on the Locked on Hornets podcast. Don't go to sleep on the Hornets just yet. Hornets live analyst from Ballet, Terrence Oglesby, going to be joining us, also former Clemson basketball player, the newest uh, member of the Hornets broadcast family, going to be talking about his introduction, what you should know about him as he broadcasts games at the Spectrum Center for all of the home contests. So it's going to be a lot of fun talking to him. We'll get to him in just a moment. This episode is, pri is brought to you by Prize Picks. It is the most fun you can have winning up to 25 times your money this football season. You just select two or more players, pick more or less than their projected stats, and then you can place your entry. It's that easy. They have quick with, uh, withdrawals as well, easy gameplay. There is an enormous selection of players and stat types. That's what makes Prize Picks the number one daily fantasy sports app. So what you can do is you can go to prizepicks.com slash locked on NBA and use code locked on NBA for a first deposit match up to $100. Again, go to prizepicks.com slash locked on NBA and use code locked on NBA for a first deposit match up to $100. It is the most fun you'll have on a daily fantasy sports app or website. More locked on Hornets. Terrence Oglesby coming up next. Now we welcome Terrence Oglesby, Hornets live analyst. You can see him at halftime of the Hornets home games every single broadcast. The basketball analyst, not only for Hornets live, but doing a ton of other stuff. Still covering college basketball for the field of 68 and CBS. Follow him on Twitter at T underscore Oglesby 22. Terrence, did I leave anything out? Is there anything else you have on your plate? Because it feels like I, I opened the season with Fox. Okay. Next, was there it you next go. Monday, I'm up at Marquette. <laughs> So there you go. I'll be up at Marquette the, on Monday. I think we have a Hornets game on Wednesday, and then I'm back up at Marquette on Friday. So, all right. So a busy man to yeah, say busy the man, least. busy yeah, man, all over the place. Well, and I know we. So we got to talk on WFNZ before your first game, and mm -hmm. you talked about very openly, guys. I'm nervous for this one. You know, the, the, making the jump from college basketball. <laughs> 
to professional basketball, it clearly is a different product. It's very, it's a different game that's played there. How do you feel now after a couple of games under your belt, Detroit and Atlanta, do you feel a little bit better and did it meet your expectations of what you were getting into? Uh, yeah, I feel better. Uh, to be honest with you, I forgot, I forgot how fun the NBA game is like it flies up and down. The ball moves quickly. They're scoring a ton of points. And, uh, you know, when it comes down to it, I said this about Brandon Miller the other day, it was like, you know, you tran- he transfers from college at a high level to, to the pros and there, there is an adjustment, but you, you know, basketball is basketball. Well, I was, I was almost talking to myself a little bit because I was a little discouraged walking, walking into it. But it's been, uh, it, to be honest with you, it could not have gone better the first couple of days. Uh, I, I work with some real pros. I mean, Eric Kendall, the producer, all those guys back there in a the truck, they make it really easy. And they're they're really, really good. I mean, I, I walk in, I might pitch an idea or two, but for the most part, they've already had the show lined up. All that stuff is ready to go. And then, of course, you know, working with somebody like Ashley, like you want to talk about making your job easy. It, it just flows and everything's so, uh, I think, rhythmic is the right way to put it. She just puts everything together so nicely. So it's it works out really well. Uh, I've worked with Eric Collins before I knew him and Dell Curry might be the nicest individual I've ever met. So like put all those things in along with the adjustment and, and all those other things kind of make it seem a lot easier than what it probably really is. Because when you have a team like that, that everybody does their part at such a high level, I can just focus on what I am. And that's just an opinionated bald guy who loves hoop. <laughs> well, and, and yeah, you know, you know, ball and like that. I'm, so you talk to us about it. And my producer, monster college basketball fan, he was excited when you got the job. And I know how Hornets fans are. They just want somebody that knows ball. And what happens is when you are a part of this broadcast, Hornets fans cling on to you and embrace you to the highest level. And they're going to do that. And so now after a couple of games, I'm, sh- I'm sure people are thrilled. J- just as an introduction, is there anything you want Hornets fans to know about yourself a little bit more as you join the broadcast family at Valley? No, I- I'm just happy to be there. I-, I think that's a huge point. One is I-, I feel like a lot of people can feel how much I really love hoop. You know, I, I mm. you-, you say, you know, hoop, I love hoop. So therefore it makes the knowing part a lot easier just because I'll sit and watch like they play Brooklyn. Well, I don't know when you guys are going to air this, but they play Brooklyn tonight and I'm going to mm-hmm. drive up there and the whole way up, I'll just be thinking about what I could say or what I couldn't say or how the matchups work and all those things. And there's a part of me too, that like you get, because it's a team specific thing, you get kind of sucked into like, Hey man, let's go Hornets. Like let, let, let's like, I, I really want the Hornets to do well. Yeah. Like, what could the Hornets do well in order for this to work? You're becoming a sicko. It's I it's am becoming a sicko. And, and, and yeah. the cool part is, is like, I love the horn. Like I, I grew up, that was right when, Oh gosh, it was like, LJ was there. Alonzo was there. You know, they traded Kobe for Vladi and I love Vladi. I'm a Vladi guy. Like I, like, that's all that stuff. Like you remember all those things and being, I, you know, I grew up, I grew up in Tennessee about three and a half hour drive from Charlotte. I never got the, uh, I never got the pleasure of going to a game because quite frankly, when I was of the age that I would have really liked to go, we didn't have the funds to do it. And now the fact that we, uh, that I get to be a part of that and get to go to games every day, I think it's really, really cool. And, and I, I hope, my enthusiasm for basketball, my enthusiasm for actually being there shows and portrays through the screen to the audience because uh, it, it really does. Uh, it, it really is something that I'm passionate about. And I really enjoy, you know, being around it. And I played and all this and that and a third. But I, I think really what it comes down to is is my passion for both the game and my passion for the Hornets. I want to go back to the great crew that you were talking about, Ashley, Dell, EC. Did anyone give you any advice as you moved up to the pro game? Did Ashley like just get up to go up to you and say, "Hey, listen, college guy, you're in the pro, you're in pro game now. You're in my world now." <laughs> Ashley would never do that. <laughs> Ashley, Ashley is the sweetest, most professional. It'd be person. funny though. Yeah, it would have been funny. She she would never do that. But the uh, guys, I'll be honest, like I've never been. And given like we're dudes talking sports, I haven't had the privilege of working with a lot of women just because there's some things that, you know, it's, I'm on a dude talk show. I've worked with, um, Oh, what's her name? That does a bunch of big 10 stuff. Uh, Megan, uh, forget her name right now, but I've worked with her, but I've never really been in a public setting with that, Mm -hmm. man. The amount of men 
that like call out, we love you, Ashley. We love you. Oh yeah. And then and all this stuff, like a, a true pro, because like it, it, it got mm -hmm. to a point where I was like, good God, how are you focused right now? Mm -hmm. And like, she just done a, she's done a really good job of, of managing all that obviously, cause she's done it for so long. But uh, anyway, no, she didn't give me advice. I did look over to her one time. I was like, Hey, if I'm ever talking too much, just shut me up. And same for you guys right now on this <laughs> podcast or locked on stream or whatever this is like, <laughs> just tell me, Hey, all right, that's enough. That's enough. And she's like, no, everything's good. And, and, um, I think there's a, there's an element too, of when I got hired for this position, they knew what they were getting because yeah. you, you know, Bally contacted me. It was kind of crazy how it worked out. It was like, my agent called me on a Tuesday. He said, Hey, I need you to take this zoom on a Wednesday. On Thursday, I was offered the job on Friday. I signed a contract on Monday. Monday, it was announced. Boom. It was like, <laughs> yeah, it was like one of these things where, uh, we were familiar with each other. I knew the product that Bally puts out and, uh, it's all just worked out really, really well. The only person I have leaned on a lot has been Eric Kendall. Just to kind of okay. understand who's the producer, who, 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 just to kind of understand the process, the rhythm of how everything goes. Um, you know, he reaches out to me pretty consistently before shows, giving me kind of an idea of what we're going to be talking about. So I have time to prepare. I, I do rely on him a lot. So uh, while Ashley hasn't given me pointers, Eric certainly has. Do you have any other questions, Doug? Do you want to move on? Oh, and I want to move on, to talk some hoops. Hornets talk, content. Uh, yeah, talk yep. what's going on on the court right now. Yep. All right, let's get to some Hornets content. That's Terrence Oglesby, Hornets Live Analyst. He'll be joining us for one more segment. Let's get to it. Coming up next on Lockdown Hornets. Don't go to sleep on the Hornets. More just Terrence yet. Oglesby here in the last segment. Coming up, we'll finally get to the actual Hornets content, get his thoughts on what he's seen so far. This episode is brought to you by FanDuel. You can score early and often this NFL season with FanDuel, America's number one sport. Sportsbook. Right now, new customers get $150 in bonus bets with any winning $5 money line bet. That's a $150 win if your team wins. If you've been thinking about joining the FanDuel uh, family as well, there's no better time to get in on the action. The app is so easy. There's a wide range of betting options, including spreads, player props, over-unders, even more than that. Visit FanDuel.com slash locked on and kick off the NFL season. FanDuel, the official partner of the NFL. More Locked On Hornets coming up. All right, we got to know you a little bit more. Now the listeners know the Terrence Oglesby story, at least a, a little bite-sized portion of it. I do want to get your thoughts on the Charlotte Hornets, how they've looked in the first two games. One win on opening night. That was a lot of fun. Second game, not so much. You know, guys reverted to after playing a good game, not playing so well against Detroit. Everybody had a big old problem with the officials. Let, let's go with the rookie first, though. Let's go with Brandon <laughs> the officials Miller. were go. guessing. Woo! It was bad. Lots of people not very happy with what the officials were putting out there. I did want to start with what has been a positive the first two games, though. Brandon Miller in this one, not only in the opener did he hit shots that mattered after a little bit of a cold start, then goes on the eight-point stretch in two minutes. But even in this game against Detroit, where there were some guys that were cold, he comes in, he gives you 17 off the bench, 6 of 13. What have been your thoughts on the second overall selection out of Alabama? Just tough. Like anybody who doesn't back down from Isaiah Stewart, and hey, it came down, you know, two, three times to where like there's some jaw jacking and all that stuff going on. Uh, doesn't back down. I, I think the kid's incredibly tough. That's a middle Tennessee kid. Anytime there's a Tennessee kid, I'm just going to let you guys know. Old T.O.'s throwing it out there because we, there's not many of us that hoop at a high level. And <laughs> uh, he's obviously the next great one out of Tennessee. <clears throat> but no, I he hits shots. He plays within the flow of the offense. You've heard Steve Clifford say a lot of good things about him. And Steve's not – he's he's earned the reputation of being somebody that doesn't necessarily play a lot of rookies at the end of games. Mm -hmm. Brandon Miller was in there. Now, what I will say about these first two games, Brandon Miller as well, is, is there's still a learning curve with this unit. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, you obviously have your centerpiece in LaMelo. You have PJ, who you've signed to a three-year extension. You have some of these other guys that are a huge part of what you do. But Brandon Miller is going to have times where it's going to be head-scratching. There were two offensive rebounds inside of five minutes in the fourth quarter that it seemed like Charlotte would get it to three, four points maybe. And then it was like, gosh, they just can't get over that hump. Uh, Brandon Miller missed two box outs in crucial parts. Mm-hmm. 
And there was a portion of the, there were at the it was about three and a half minutes. Steve Clifford finally said, "Hey, Lamelo, go get Brandon because we got to we got to we got to rebound. We got to close this game out." And that's a that's a learning experience thing. Like what you do in the NBA for the first three quarters is different than what you're going to be doing in the fourth quarter, and especially during the regular season, you're going to have to lay wood on that box out. Like that's going to be something to where it's like, well, like you have to finish possessions. I thought Mark Williams, you're going to look at another guy like him, was terrific in game one. Game two, that game got more physical. And the Pistons are a physical bunch now. Like big, athletic, you know, basically, I'm not going to say ready to fight, but they play with a certain bravado that it's like, hey, man, if you don't bring your lunch pail, you're in trouble. Because these guys are really going to bring it, especially in the front court. He has to learn to play that game the same way he has to learn to play against Clint Capella in game one. Mm -hmm. Right? So, like... While there are spots where you're like, man, the Hornets look good, there are going to be these spots where it was, you know, in Detroit, where, where they played Detroit, where it's like, gosh, they're close, yeah. but they're just not where they need to be yet because they still have to adjust to some of these things. And, and these issues with uh, rebounding, physicality, toughness, uh, these aren't new issues for the Charlotte Hornets. This isn't a this year no. kind of thing. I mean, these are issues that are leaking over from last season as well. I'm curious, Terrence, in your experience at Clemson and playing pro ball, have you ever been on teams, experienced this, where there was maybe a lack of physicality to open a season, a lack of toughness? And what do you do about that as maybe from the coaching staff's perspective or from the player's perspective, locker room, what do you do about that? Let me put it this way. I've been a leading scorer on a lot of bad teams in Europe. So let me just go ahead and say that before I get going. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, no, I, you know, it's it's harder in the NBA because you can't just go reach and grab new guys, mm -hmm. right? Like you can't just bring somebody who's suspended and then make put him on the floor whenever times get tough because you need some physicality. That's I think that's a huge thing, and they they would have really liked Miles Bridges against the Pistons because he brings a certain tenacity to your squad, right? Um, there, you know what? As far as it's something, the NBA is so different because you're playing 82 games. You almost have to point it out, and I'm not an NBA coach, so this is going to be this is easier said than done, obviously. But when you have a bunch of young men that are making so much money, you have to make the guys see it themselves. Mm -hmm. As opposed to like me coming up and saying like, "Hey, dude, you didn't box out. That's bullshit. You have right, to show right. that person, right? And you have to prove it to them." I, I talked to uh, I talked to a, a volleyball coach, and this is kind of crazy for me to even bring up, but he said he coached men and he coached women, and he said and he coached national championships with both of them. And I'm going to leave his name out of here, but he said the difference between coaching men and women is is when you coach women, you have to tell them what they do right. When you coach men, you have to tell them what they do wrong. And you have to go a step further with NBA guys because these are the best players in the world. And you have to not only show them what, tell them what they do wrong, but you have to show them because they've been, you know, they've been so good their entire life. They're not necessarily just going to believe you because they've been able to get by with things their entire life just because of their physical ability. Now you can tell them, but you also have to show them. So, and then once they buy into seeing those things, then eventually you can turn around and then you can start to see some change within it. And in, in, Mark, what he put on thirty five pounds in the off season, like muscle wash was real for him. It was like, I think it was like fifteen twenty, but yeah. it, I mean, yeah, at least that's what he was and talking he needs about. More, yeah, well, and certainly use it against yeah, Detroit. That's the thing. Like, you, he's going to get better, but you also have to let him see it. You have to mm -hmm. let Brandon Miller see those boxes at the at the end. And I think with Brandon, it's going to be easier because he's so talented and so skilled. Like he's going to see something once, he's going to be like, all right, won't have it again. And then it'll happen easier for him. Doug, you want one more question before we end with Terrence no, today? Is this no, it? it? Is this it? I talked for the whole 15 minutes that quick. Well, we're going to have you back. Guess. I mean, we got to say this something the for the next time. This is, this on, is my know? problem right here. This is what Eric Kendall. Hey, man, tone it back. Tone it well, back. Well, look, the, the, the daily format is we we go daily. So they, they hear us talk all the time. That's kind of how this works. We wanted you on so you could talk pretty much okay. the entire time. Well, That's look, we I mean, and, and we can't go. Well, listen, we can't go a segment without mentioning LaMelo Ball. I mean, yeah. I don't know how much uh, LaMelo you got to watch uh, before taking on this gig. I mean, coming into this season, he's coming off the injury. He doesn't look he doesn't look totally back. And Steve Clifford has even mentioned this, that he's that he's finding a rhythm. What do you see in his game so far through two games that says, yeah, he's not like 
quite all the way there, but but here are the kind of glimmers of of what he what he can be if he you know reaches that all NBA potential. Um, Lamelo takes some wild ones, <laughs> but um, what I will say about Lamelo is is he knows he's not fully in rhythm yet, and what has he done to tr- try to counteract that? He's gotten to the free throw line a lot. Mm-hmm. And to me, that shows an evolution in his game to where like, hey, I can still realize I can still make an impact on this game, even when some of these shots aren't falling from the perimeter. And the fact that he's getting to the free, what do you have, 12 free throw attempts last game? Yeah, yeah. I mean, that's that's huge, especially for him. And, and I, I see that as a step in his evolution as a player, because when you get paid that kind of money, you have to find ways to score. He hasn't been as good as what a lot of people think he's supposed to be through the first two games. And I think it's going to take him five, 10 games, guys like. Let's call it what it is. Like you're playing 82 games, I think the first five to seven, whatever. It's going to take him a second to get back into it. But the fact that he's impacting the game so much without necessarily being the best version of himself shooting from the perimeter, I think speak volumes. And I think I think the fact that it validates the money that he's been paid simply because you see him trying to attack things differently and the truly great ones can really do that according to the game according to the setup so i think as Lamelo does that you know his post-game interviews aren't much but if you really pay attention to the style that he's playing there are adjustments being made he's just not going to tell you so that's kind of where the difference is with him yeah all right that's terrence he also had 29 and 9 20 points, nine boards, and nine assists. Well, this is what happens, right? I mean, it, when, yeah. when you when you criticize Lamelo, or if you just have some things that you would like to see continue to evolve, you yeah. end up looking at the box score, and he's flirting with a triple double. <laughs> that's the kind of the player he is. That's yeah, how it he's is. A, he's an analytics darling. Yeah. Oh yeah. Well, especially the three point shot. It, it even if he takes some wild ones, he's been taking a lot more last year and the thirty six games he played. Even now, he's still taking a lot, but he hits a lot of them as well. Dude, he right. hit a step back one legged three pointer from the left corner last game. And I'm sitting here watching. And I'm just like, that is a horrendous shot. Bottom. Well, would the coach <laughs> take you out if you attempted that shot? Right. Me? Yeah. Yeah. yeah you. They knew yes. what they were getting into. They knew what they were getting into. <laughs> <laughs> They knew what happened when they signed me. I was about to say, you're a, you were a sniper as well, man. Like, yeah, at Clemson, and you would you would let that thing fly. So I was about to say, I'm. Sure, do we have any one legged step back three pointers from Terrence in, in, no. in his days at Clemson? Nothing like that. Okay, I wasn't strong. You, you know, <laughs> that's a hard shot, man. And he's six eight. <laughs> yeah, like, and for him to be able to even get it up there, it comes from his ability to shoot that ball directly with two hands right in front of his face. Like you have to shoot that ball with two hands to get it there like that. I, I couldn't. I could probably do it. Don't get me wrong, but no, I, 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 I had to stay above forty in order to keep getting jobs. Hmm. <laughs> that's, okay, that's Terrence Oglesby. You can find him every halftime of the and even beforehand. Hornets live analyst there at the Spectrum Center during Hornets games. He's also doing a ton of college basketball stuff. Field of sixty eight, CBS. You even said you were doing stuff for Fox now renaissance man all over the place terrence oglesby thanks so much for the time we really appreciate it thanks guys thank you for having me yeah man big thanks to terrence oglesby i think he's going to be great doug uh, we got to see him we joked about it he knows basketball man and he loves it he told you he loves it and now he's a sicko too like, he's a what sicko else? i should have I, sh- I should have said i'm sorry i should have apologized that he's a sicko but we, listen we didn't <laughs> choose this life it chose us it chose terrence uh it chose yeah. uh it chose me it chose you uh, but we're in this together, and whatever happens this season, uh, Terrence is a part of it, and a, and a great part of it. I mean, he gave us a, we're looking for those juicy nuggets, and he gave us a, a yeah, couple man. of those juicy nuggets that I think he's given you on the broadcast, too. Yeah, love it. Absolutely love what we're getting from Terrence. And and I, I knew a little bit, like I, I was a consumer of his product, his content, because of all the college basketball discussion. And I knew a couple people that loved what he does already. And so you can see that uh, with him hopping on the Hornets broadcast. So it should be a lot of fun. Hope hope to have him on somewhat regularly. Thanks for making us your first listen. You know, Catch us anywhere you get your pods every single day and make us your first listen every day. Speaking to those everydayers, We have another game tonight, the third game of the Hornets season against the Nets. That one also taking place at the Spectrum Center. I believe that's the end of the homestand, and then they hit the road 
after that. So we'll see what kind of home record the Hornets can accumulate to start the year. And then we'll be right back here to talk all about it as we do every single Monday through Friday. Have a great rest of your day. We'll be back with you tomorrow.